And we're back, Tim, for another episode of Project Management on Steroids. No, I'm just kidding. It's just let's have a nice coffee chat today. How's that? That sounds wonderful. I have tea, but I think it's a good time to start off. What and and just like we do at the end of uh um of every good meal when we're on the road we always have to have a story to go with our dessert what's your story today well so i'll use the story to kick us off how's that instead of ending maybe maybe we can circle back to the same story i just i i was intrigued by the topic that we um agreed upon for this week i think it harkens back to one that we've uh looked at before in terms of team and stakeholder and and uh staff on projects. Um, but I think what whetted my appetite on this was our conversation over the last three weeks about Agile and how Agiles are, Agile is all about relationships and, and that sort of thing. So team is important. But I, but I just, it, it made me think of a situation, this goes back several years, when I was managing a project that was actually for a state government organization for another state. In other words, a different state than the one you and I live in. But um, as I was out there, one of the things that, or one of the events that happens with these projects is that the federal government, which um, funds them largely, sometimes to 90%, sometimes to 100%, they obviously want to make sure that their dollars are being spent wisely and that the eventual result of the project will, uh, will garner them what it is that they're looking for from that particular project. Well, it just so happened we had one of these gate reviews and three or four um folks came from washington from from our government federal government to take a look at what we were doing how our progress was doing a complete sort of top down bottom up review of our progress and our status and and some of the functionality that we'd already managed to put into test and here's what intrigued me because you know it's a huge endeavor for the team to get ready for this to make sure you're showing your best face you're putting your best foot forward. And what intrigued me was when the state's project director came back to speak to me after they had left. And he told us what a great job we had done and his team had done. And then he said this, and this stuck with me till today. This has been years ago and it still stuck with me. On their way out, the project reviewers from Washington, D.C. looked at him and said, you know, we talked to about 15 people. We still don't know who is vendor and we don't know who's your staff. It's such a strong commingled team, who's who? <laughs> and I think to me, that was the best example of team and also stakeholder engagement um, that, that probably happened in my career. Wow, what a statement. Yeah. You know, that, that brings up the big question. Um, let me try to tackle it first. What do we mean by staff? Because that's what we're talking about here. That usually when we say staff, we talk about all the people in and around. Um, so when, when I teach project management, I look at staff sort of like a job title. Like that, that's what they come in and get their paycheck for. But when we look at projects and project management, we don't have staff as a role in projects. We have like team or stakeholders. Um, what's your take on this? I think, I think it's similar to what you just talked about. Staff tends to be individuals. Team tends to, tends to, in my mind, tends to be us as a group moving the project forward to that eventual outcome. But I think um, if I really or if I really pin down staff, um, sometimes it's also people who are outside of the project per se. And I can think of many times shutting down my computer, leaving say at 7 p.m. to go get dinner and go home, and the janitorial staff comes in. They're not part of the project, but boy, if we didn't have them, what a mess we'd have in the morning. So I think there's staff and there's team. There's, there's, there's a third too that overlaps called stakeholders. Yeah. 
And, and by definition, stakeholders are the ones who impact your project and can be impacted by your project. And, and again, they're the ones that clean up. They're the ones who can accidentally kick the cables out from behind your servers too. Um, but again, you know, staff are the people and stakeholders are the jobs and tasks of the people who impact the work. And the team are the jobs and the tasks of the people who do the work. You know, and, and we can talk about this like staff collecting requirements, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, they collect requirements. They're stakeholders because they're impacting the project. But they're also team members because collecting requirements is a project management task. It moves the project forward. So these people you're talking about may be staff, but they're both stakeholders and team. Does that, does that feel uh, comfortable? It, it does. Although I'll tell you from my perspective or from my experience, typically we held stakeholders up as decision makers, as those people who maybe paid the way. So while um, your definition may have been a little more broad than what I'm used to, um, a lot of times we, we would say the project director or the CIO or the CEO or the, in a government situation, the, the director of the department, those tended to be my stakeholders, the ones that I was beholden to to make sure that we did a good job and de delivered the outcome that we had been paid to deliver. So yeah, maybe mine's a little more, maybe my definition is a little more narrow, but, but I think we're on the same, kind of on the same track. Let me, let me tell you why I'm a little more broad. Yeah. This was happening with a corporation up in the Pacific Northwest and we were helping them with a data center strategy. And, <coughs> excuse me, we'd gone in for about six weeks to help them make the decision of whether or not they wanted it. And then now if they wanted it, we had seven to nine months to help them put together a plan. The CIO said, you know, here's an admin over here. She's been with the company for about 25 years. So, so she knows all the ins and outs. Um, you know, she, she's, she's, not assigned to anything right now, but I think you're going to find her really effective. <laughs> and boy, howdy, she cleared so much chaos. She helped the, uh, sort things out. She helped us put things in context. She was our go-to person for the culture, the politics, for the organizational structure, for everything. She wasn't a decision maker, but man, was she a facilitator. And that's, that's where I see stakeholders really powerful when you can engage people who actually help you in this clarification. Yeah, that makes, in fact, using the example that I just gave you when I started this off with that story of the federal reviewers who'd come to town, um, the project director from the government that came and told me of this observation was clearly my main stakeholder. He was the one who needed me absolutely, needed me, needed our team absolutely to succeed. But his staff, that is his subject matter experts from the various divisions within his department that were on the project and participating were also in many ways stakeholders because what we ended up with, they would have to live with. And some of them were division directors on their own so that when they took back the project to their own um, staff, to their teams to serve the public, they had to be proud of their accomplishment because after all they worked on it and promoted it. And in fact, made sure that it was well known out there that this was going to save folks a lot of time and, and help their public. So they became not only participants and team, but also very strong advocates and, and stakeholders on our team. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, where, that's where they're engaging in the work and, and you're actually helping them with that engagement. So we talked about Agile a couple of, for the last three weeks, I think it was. So can you put this in kind of the context of Agile in terms of how we would look at this, this is an example of how Agile would work with staff, with team, with stakeholders. 
let's just take one group of work planning yeah. right I, I i think if we if we focus down into just one example where we're planning no 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 let's even do better than that let's let's go into the actually the team is doing the development work and we're we're doing a cycle of prototypes so they can get their hands on it and give feedback to us right um they're right there with you um, the the stakeholders are not just the decision makers, but the stakeholders are the people who are going to do the work. One of the reasons why Agile took off in the 90s and the 2000s was executives were making decisions without input from the people doing the work. And so when you made a change in operations or a change in process, it may have been good for strategy, but from a functional standpoint, it failed. You know, again, the, the, the change was great and it was a miserable failure for business. And, and we saw this throughout the late 80s and 90s. So the transition into Agile ensured, number one, you have the decision makers thoroughly integrated in. But number two, you have these people who are the workers and responsible for getting good work done. Um, actually participating in this change. Does that, does that help you there? Oh, it does. And, and the fact that the working level of the organization is rubbing shoulders and elbows with the stakeholders, maybe all the way up to CEO, is a great thing because I'm sure those CEOs or those division directors or department directors have their eyes open frequently when they hear what they're staff contends with in the as is um, process that they're currently working under. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and <laughs> it's it's dangerous for a worker to be unplugged, right? Because they're, oh, yeah. they're not going to get any work done. But to have an executive unplugged and unaware of the impact in the work is incredibly dangerous. Because number one, they don't know how the work getting done fits in their piece of the strategy and who they report into doesn't want to hear oh i was blindsided by this project um so so it's it's not just a nice to have it's a requirement well it, it is and it's as you mentioned that in the 90s and two, early 2000s a lot of executives were still making those decisions that affected their staff but without any input you know, sometimes when I look at a large organization, it's, it's like turning a huge aircraft carrier around. The, the pilot can make the decision to make the turn, but it takes a long time to actually have that turn happen. And if the instructions aren't clear and if they're not um, delivered down to the organization, that turn won't be very successful. I think that's exactly what we're dealing with. In those and put that in the context of a project. Yeah. And here I am where the decision is made and we have little pieces of interest that are going along their daily work. And if my project doesn't fit into the checklist of somebody's, they're not just going to be angry, they're gonna be creating emotional churn, which is gonna impact my work too. So um, when my students ask me, how many stakeholders do I identify or when do I identify my stakeholders? All I can say is yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer, because that's true. Uh, and, I, and I know in, in, in several situations, in fact, most of the projects I've had you know, you still do uh, pay a lot of respect to that primary stakeholder because they're paying your salaries in, in essence. But there are other stakeholders who, <clears throat> for example, in a lot of the government work I've done, there may be sister departments who have different constituents, but who share data. And if I'm working on a project that is moving along and, and some of the shared data is with a department that's not moving along, how do I make sure that, that my new system can still collaborate with their older system and that data gets shared? And so I have to bring the other department's stakeholders in who are not the major ones, but they're minor stakeholders and they also need to be served and serviced through this whole process. So yes, project managers' decisions with stakeholders and team and staff and, and everyone else are um, incredibly important decisions to be made on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, this this actually brings up some other things to think about. 
Um, what is the responsibility of the project manager to the stakeholders and team? Do I serve them? Are they my primary um, topic? Um, a lot of project managers um, think that people are people and here to do work and I'm not here to touch their work. Um, when we have stakeholders who have to participate in the project and the team who have to do the work, what, what, what are the boundaries for what I need to do as a project manager there? You know, and that sometimes you're, sometimes you're straddling the fence, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, you, you do, you, you absolutely owe a lot to your primary stakeholder and to the stakeholders who are depending on you to deliver on time within their precious budget. You may be getting paid out of their funds, but it's their funds. So you do owe them that much in terms of making sure that their dollars are well spent. At the same time, you have a team, be it co-located with your client or be it your own team that just has the client staff come in every once in a while. But that team who is on the ground making the day-to-day -day decisions and moving the project forward need to be treated in such a way that they are engaged, that they can motivate themselves, that they can progress the project, that they can look back at you, their project manager, and say, am I doing a good job? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? So sometimes with those two competing requirements, sometimes you have to kind of straddle, but make sure that both are satisfied. And that, and that becomes one of the um, artful parts, not the science parts, but the artful parts of what a project manager does. Right, right. So what we're talking about is twofold, actually. Number one, meeting the needs of people so they can keep working and working well. You know, give them enough time, give them, give them enough recognition, give them enough um, um, engagement. Now, when I say recognition, um, it doesn't mean praise and it doesn't mean rewards. It means you're doing good work and I yeah. see that. You're visible. <laughs> you're not irrelevant, you know, yeah. and, and that takes time. Um, it, it, it's not me. It doesn't mean you're a member of the family. It mem means you're a member of the team and you are a successful member of the team and we need you to remain successful. And how do I do this? Well, and just think about what we just went through this last year and may go through again with the pandemic. And that is how to keep those folks visible, right? When they're working on their project tasks, but in the confines of their own home office. And some of them are on a card table in their own living rooms with kids running around. And, and you have to help those folks as well to, to understand that they are visible, that they count, that they mean something to the project. And that uh, as soon as we can get you all back together and shake hands and hug and all that kind of stuff, you know, things will be better. But in the meantime, you're absolutely right. We need to keep those folks, every single person visible. Yeah, um, this is this is critical, and the even though people work remote, it doesn't mean their needs change. The needs of the human doesn't change from office to home or home to office. What changes are the channels that you have to share that recognition and communication and engagement, and that's the trick. The second thing that I've learned from teaching these people who've been <laughs> working from home for a year and a half is that the team recognizing and supporting and engaging is almost as important as the project manager. So this is a trainable and training opportunity for the project manager to create that healthy culture. Everybody crosses the line at the same time. We leave no one behind. Having that as almost a mantra in your team charter um, is critical when, when you have uh, a dispersed team. Well, it is. And, I, and you know, I remember the days when we'd be working hard on a project and solving a problem and, and someone would be frustrated or someone would be worn out or something. And it was just so easy to say, you know what, let's take a break. Let's walk downstairs, go across to the Starbucks or to whatever's there. Let's grab a coffee, chat a little bit and then come back, clear our heads and then come back. 
And I think what you just described, we can do exactly the same thing with a remote team to say, it, hey, in five minutes, let's get together on WebEx or Zoom or whatever we're using. Use this five minutes to make your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, get your favorite soda, and let's just kind of put our feet up and talk, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's it, it may feel funny to do that over WebEx or Zoom a couple times, but I was, uh, I was co-teaching in a university class this summer, and some of the best conversations happened at break. A student asked a question, and it caused three other students to ask other questions, and it was like, it was like they were relaxed and they're comfortable, and they were still into the zone of problem solving and engaging, which allowed them to actually explore with more of their faculties. So we keep using this term engaging. What exactly is, uh, you know, I have, I think I have a good definition. What's your definition? Or what, so, maybe what's your concept? How's that? My context, I think that's a good one. Um, engaging is keeping people involved. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's through sharing information because people are curious, through recognition because people need to be relevant, and it's through interaction and sharing work too. Um, this, this is basically what I mean by that big, you know, capital P, capital M project management definition. Yeah. And I, and I think that's right. I think if we keep people involved, we get their commitment, which is part of, I think, which is part of that whole engagement. And it, when I see people who are engaged, I see an energy. I see that they've got an investment and they're energized. And sometimes they'll look up at their, um, at the clock on the wall and it's eight o'clock at night and they go, where'd the time go? And look how much I got done. And that's, you know, they feel engaged because they feel like they're contributing and they're relevant. And I think you used the word before visible. And a lot of that, if we, I, and I love the way you put it, we as project managers set the culture. We can't go up to people and say, you must be engaged, but we can set the culture, the environment, and that sort of thing to allow people to feel like they can become engaged. And, and it's simple. It really is. Simon Sinek put it really well. There are three basic needs everybody has. We can talk about Maslow if you want, but we can actually put it down to three basic needs. Number one, I, I need to feel safe. So in, in the face of a reorg or the face of a pandemic, you know, it's, it's the rule the project manager says things are going to be all right. They're going to be goofy, but together we'll figure this out. People need a little bit of control. Um, delegation is a powerful tool. Delegation is a leader or project manager showing trust. I trust you to take responsibility of this. And then at the end of the day, everybody needs to look in the mirror and say, I did work. <laughs> I feel worn out, but this is great work. It's, it's like going out in your yard and trimming some bushes and having the neighborhood see that you trimmed bushes and it looks nice. Everybody needs that, um, those three things. And if you just create an environment that fosters those three things, people will naturally work. And I think you and I talked about motivation in one of our past podcasts. It's, I think it's the same thing. Engagement, motivation, it, that comes from within. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have people who basically go through the motions and collect their paycheck. One might say that they are little e engaged because they at least got their job done, but they weren't really engaged, big e engaged. So if you produce, like we we're just talking about that, that environment, that culture, not only are they engaged, but they're motivated to be engaged as well. And I think that comes from within and it's something we can foster, but not force. Right. Right. Now, we have a unique opportunity. Um, other managers inside the company have organizational culture that they may or may not have control over. In our projects, we have autonomy to actually say this project's a little different from the organization, so our culture is going to have to be a little bit different. And this is a little bit of freedom for us to explore and to share with our curious uh, stakeholders and team. 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. And, and what I will say too is when I was, before I went out on my own as, as a um, independent consultant, when I worked for a firm, we never worked on projects. We always worked on engagements. Uh-huh. Isn't that an interesting term? Words matter. And oh, so yeah. when we put together our team, yes, we, did, we called it a project team, but we went to the engagement. We engaged with our client. We engaged with each other. Most importantly, we engaged in such a way that we produced results. I love we, that word. Yeah, we ought to talk more about uh, uh, culture and, uh, and terminology between consulting and project management, because I think, con- um, I think project management and agile could learn a lot from what you and I have experienced in consulting itself. Yeah, and sometimes we forget. I'm I'm actually working on an, in an advisory capacity to an agile project right now, and it's interesting because you come at it from your perspective. In, in this case, I come at it from my years of experience, and in my mind, I forget that these people haven't had the same experience or the or as many years of experience. And you're sitting there going, "Why didn't they get that? I'm I don't understand why they didn't get that." But it's but you can't, you can't assume, right? You have to be able to help people along themselves. So it, consulting, project management, advisory services, all of these things, you're right, they can really help the agile environment to be that relational team. And it's, it's so important that the first thing in uh, project management training and preparation for the PMP exam is the care and uh, support of the team and stakeholders. That that right there comes before everything else. And it's it's funny because the class always asks, where's the charter? <laughs> and I'm saying, no, we're not going in sequence here. We're going yeah. in what is the most important thing for me to be focusing on throughout the entire project. Um, you're, you're spot on there. And, and that's a great point. I remember going on to projects in the first week doing nothing with my team except getting to know each other. Well, I wouldn't say a whole week, maybe two days. But us, the client, we'd have evening dinners. We'd have just to get to know each other before we even put pen to ink or hands to, to keyboard and, and develop that charter because we wanted to understand who we were in order to develop that way of work, that working style that we would soon be influenced by. And then we could put, put ink to paper at that point. Right. Very good. Very good. So, so one of the th- other topics that you and I talked about in other shows, as well as uh, throughout the w- week, this last week, was um, protecting the dignity of your team. Let's, let's dive into that a little bit. One, one of the things that I've noticed is that as a project manager, I'm the advocate of the team to the executives. And I'm the advocate of the executives to the team. I'm sort of the translator and negotiator and uh, arbitrator between the two. Can you speak to how you might protect the dignity of your team when you're, when you're working through these relationships? Well, and, and let me add to that because you really have two sets of executives, or at least my experience, you have two sets of executives, your own from the, and I was on the vendor side and the clients. It's, am- it's amazing to me how um, client executive aren't as aloof as you think they are. <laughs> they hear things from their team. They walk the floor, they see and because they don't necessarily understand, sometimes they bring something to your attention about your team that is based on their perception, but is not based on reality. So in order to protect the dignity of the team, which by the way, everyone has dignity, everyone's dignity is worth protecting. But in order to do so, a lot of times it's just a matter of explaining to the executive what they saw. It's a matter of talking to your team and saying, you know, perception is more important than reality sometimes. So let's make sure that the perception we're leaving is the real one so that people don't get the wrong idea. But at the same time, I think if the executive, whether it's your executive or the client executive, sees you stepping in front of 
and advocating for your team, they themselves will then begin to respect the dignity of your team. This is a tough place to be. Yeah. Um, it, it really is uh, because again, you're, you're an advocate and you're a facilitator. Um, one of the things that uh, I've, I've uh, noticed is that not everybody wants to have the truth. <laughs> they oh, yeah. want to have something that supports their objectives. And uh, to have anything challenge is threatening. How do, how do I support a team when I have an executive, whether it's my client side or whether it's the, um, um, the uh, internal to my organization side, when, when these objectives that are outside the project um, seem to be threatened. And, and again, you're right, these are perceptions. I, I think, again, it's just that taking a sit down. Well, first of all, clarifying with the person who has the concern, the executive that has the concern or, who, or the stakeholder, sit down with them and say, okay, let's talk this through. I'm, I need to understand what your concern is. And I will take it back to my team and I'll work with my team to make sure that you are satisfied with this. But I really need to understand what is it that you're seeing that I can help you understand uh, from our perspective. Not, not that I can help you understand, you dummy. It's that I can help you understand from where we're sitting in developing this system and developing and working through these tasks on your behalf. I think that's the starting point. Yeah, yeah. And, and being prepared for those conversations, especially on these massively large and complex projects, going into the project and sh basically sharpening these arrows that you know will be very useful. Like, okay, um, let's look at the client's executives. Do they need any support in understanding how to manage conflict? Do they need any support in understanding how to use debate and how to use, you know, persuasion? Are these, are these managers and executives formally trained in solving issues not in generating conflict. And it, it's not a negative uh, statement I'm making here, but I've gotten into so many environments where I'm working with executives who really do not understand the, uh, the role of the manager in, you know, in making good decisions instead of reacting to their perceptions. You know, it would be interesting to know how many managers in our country, both in um, both in private and in public organizations, actually were trained for their position versus <laughs> being promoted because they were the next person in line or the most skilled person on the floor. I mean, so some of what you just said is true because people have not had that training. Um, and, and even the ones who have the training have not invested in integrating what they've learned into their experience and their culture. And, and this, is the, this is the real sad truth is even though we have undergraduate and graduate business degrees, you know, it, 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 everybody says it's theory and fluff. No, <laughs> it isn't. It's actually learning how to stop the reaction of your limbic brain and consider and use your uh, cerebral cortex as that break. And this takes years of practice. This is why relationships are some of the most un, uh, under supported and most critical components of what we're doing because we're, we're under a time crunch and most organizations, you know, are gonna last forever, but in a project, you can't do that. So you have to walk into a project saying, look, if I'm ready for these type of issues and I'm ready for this type of conflict, why don't I just start training these people before we have problems? So training 
our stakeholders and our um, executives is a line item in what a project manager really should be preparing for. Yeah, I, I agree. I, the, two of my largest projects that I served as an independent on behalf of the client, as we solicited responses for a vendor to come in and work on the project, two of those before the vendor came on board, I sat down with the team that was seconded to the project sat down and I said, this is what we spent a couple of days role playing and doing the sorts of things. That said, this is what your IT vendor staff is going to be like. This is how you need to prepare to, to be prepared to deal with them. And it was amazing how, as you said, the minute they walked on and like, like a shot out of a cannon, we're ready to go with that project. So was the client staff because they were prepared to deal with those situations, they were pre-trained to deal with those situations. Yeah, and, and going through that role play may be silly, but the experience of it gains, uh, gains a certain confidence where uh, you can't really, uh, you, you, can't, you can't really create that confidence without that experience. Well, in my case, because I had come from the vendor community, it was easy for me to play that role. And it was easy for me to mimic the behaviors of the people they were about to meet. So, so yeah, they got a taste of these young, bright, fast moving, I'll call them aggressive or maybe assertive folks that just needed to get their tasks done and to show their boss that they're worthy of their next promotion. So, you know, we had to get them prepared for that whole process. But, but let me go ahead. You were going to say, no, something. no, 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 go ahead. But, but let me um, offer something else. And this is, I've, I've noticed this over probably the last 10 or so years as the management that I have worked with both on the client side and, and with IT vendors, as they become younger. And when I say younger, I mean younger than me. <laughs> so uh -huh. When they became managers, they were probably my age when I became a manager. But what I'm finding, and you probably are aware of this too subconsciously, when you and I broke into IT and we went up the management ranks, we were still very much often, um, cons uh, we were often um, looked at as those people who needed to be aggressive on behalf of the client to get the project done, no matter the cost. And so our people became cogs to get the job done. And it was kind of like that old 1950s style of management. But I'm finding that with the younger management these days, with the sort of cultural change with we respect people's dignity much more than we once did, and we keep people safe, perhaps, on the project, is I'm finding that there's less of that kind of conflict in terms of treating people as cogs as opposed to as valued members of the team. I don't know if your experience is much like that or not. You know, I am. Um, what I am noticing now, this may be, be a change in myself that's allowing others to be, but I'm noticing that both executives and workers tend to open themselves more to me as humans yeah. than as just, you know, just somebody there to check boxes off. And I'm wondering if it's my behavior that's triggering that or it's something else that is demanding it. Um, there's, there's a lot of factors going on here. Um, we have, you know, again, we've had two years of being in lockdown, which, which changed the emotional dynamics and, and those emotional needs have to be fulfilled. And, and so those are percolating up to the top. And we have executives who are insecure and and feel more out of control than they ever have and they're looking for answers um, for for opportunity to try out some of these more humanistic approaches to leadership I think this is a great time it, oh I agree with you absolutely now you had asked I think when we got this segment going how do we protect the dignity of of our team of our people and I think if I want to go back to that and kind of summarize it, I think in many ways we have to understand that people do have dignity. And so whether they're the administrative person who 
who deals with the administrative aspects of a project or your number one deputy, they are all valued members of the team and they all have dignity. You have to remember they have careers, but they also have lives outside of the office. They have feelings and emotions and they have motivations and a need for recognition. And when we understand this and help that, those feelings and those emotions and those other needs besides just our project, we help those grow as well, then, then we have a much more pleasing and more pleasant team to deal with. Yeah, um, it actually reminds me of an image. I went to corporate headquarters out in California um, a lot of times in the mid 2000s. And the CEO was often seen sitting with either a guard or a um, janitor. Hmm. And what a powerful statement that was. They didn't need to tell anybody that. They were sitting having coffee talking with them. Yeah. And just doing these things and doing it in such a way that people say this is the natural way we interact um, is an incredible statement. And it gives other managers permission to do the same thing. Well, and, and I, I remember something kind of like that. I remember a project where we had a, a deliverable. We had to make this deliverable and it required the entire team to put in um, much too much overtime but we got it done. And my boss, my project director, instead of just thanking all of our staff, went one step further and actually sent flowers to the spouses or, or basketball tickets to the spouses or what, whatever seemed appropriate to that particular spouse. This project director knew the spouses, knew what they liked and didn't like. And actually unbeknownst to the team, sent these to their homes and now the spouses felt like they were appreciated for the sacrifice they had made on behalf of the project. Oh, that is so powerful. I remember my wife um, opening a, uh, a pine garland from Maine one Christmas from one of my directors. And she, she talks about it once in a while, even now after 15 years. And, and I think, and see how powerful that is after 15 years? Yeah. And it's just because why? Because you have been recognized, right? You've been, what was the word you used earlier? Visible? Yeah, visible, engaged, yeah. exactly. And there's another part to this too, I think, Tim. And that is our project, our project staff, our teams, our stakeholders, us, we will make mistakes. We also have to have people be able to pick themselves up after making those mistakes, brush themselves off and move on with the team with full dignity. Right, 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 right. Let's go to a real hard question. I don't like hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what the project manager's there for. Aren't they there to make sure that the objectives are met? How do we balance the needs of the team and the stakeholders with the needs of the project? I, it's the, I think it's exactly what we've been talking about. We have to recognize that the project needs must be met, but we have to recognize that they can't be met on the backs of our staff. And sometimes we as vendors, and, I, and again, I'm coming from that vendor community, you know, us <laughs> greedy capitalists who want the maximum profit, but sometimes we who try to maximize profit must minimize it, bring extra staff on so that we don't kill the staff we have there if we happen to have underbid. Yes, we want to make that project successful, but we don't want to do it on the backs of our staff and our teams. Yeah, I, uh, I, um, I remember um, you know, earlier this year reading the uh, Gallup reports 16 to 18% of workers in the world feel engaged. They feel like they're plugged in and they really want to do good work, right? 16 to 18%. And it's the managers who actually have more control of that than anything else, especially the managers directly above them. And the Gallup went even further and said the influence of a manager directly above those workers has the potential for adding 
30 to 40% productivity in any corporation right this moment, if they were able to do that. 30 to 40%? (laughs) Yes. You know, I did, I remember writing a blog post where I had done some calculations that just on, and and it's much along these lines, it was a three, no, it was a hundred million dollar project. And so I had kind of done some quick calculations that if the project manager by employing more of the people aspects of, and again, it's all this protecting dignity, um, striving for motivation and engagement, this sort of thing. If all they did was to improve performance by three to 4%, three to four, not 34, three to 4%. And that reflected in the bottom line, what's three to 4% of a hundred million dollars? That's some serious cash. Right, 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 right. Now, I'm talking not just from projects, yes. but also from operations. I'm, I'm talking about GDP here, right? Um, so maybe you and I can start exploring that and talking about these hard numbers that have come out of this research. And uh, we can start exploring those on our projects, I, uh, on our show. I think we really owe the public to be, be sharing this information. I'd love to do that research. And, and if I were a person, a young project manager, or even a fairly mature project manager listening to this podcast right now, there's a clue there. I think I would, my, I think my antenna would go up right now and I'd go back into the recesses of my mind on a quiet day and say, how can I improve the performance of my project team? Because not only will that benefit my team and my client, but what an opportunity for my career. So, so here's, here's where I answer the question, you know, what comes first? Um, and I'm going to do my regular Tim job of, of a totally coming out from left field with a spin that nobody recognized. What I see is ethics and then the objective. <laughs> okay. And there's a reason for this. Um, values. Ethics have to do with what we value, something something that we put above other things, right? Um, the things that we value are the things that change our perceptions. How we perceive things regulates our behavior, and our behavior influences the outcomes of ourselves and the world around us. So we have a lot of ability to change our world if we understand that chain, that value chain, from values to perception to behavior, okay? Now, as project managers, if we can actually understand that, then we understand our influence on what you're talking about, the human factor of projects. It's not that we need to change them, we need to change ourselves. And this was the upshot of the reports. It's not that I need to change the world around me. I can't, 90% of the time I can't, it's, it's outside of my control. But what I can control are my values, my behavior, and my perceptions. And that's how I actually gain more control over my life. And if I can give that to people in my project, they'll feel more comfortable. They'll open up and they'll relax. So ethics and the objective together from from my my side of the planet, that looks like it's about all that there needs to be. Well, and particularly, and I, and I agree with you, ethics comes first. So when you ask the question, what comes first, the needs of the project or the needs of the team? And if the project needs were such that I would have to do, that I would have to somehow, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Somehow um, break away from my own ethical, ethical considerations or my own value system, I would have to come to that decision which I would make up my mind beforehand to be able to act this way in any situation, I'd have to be able to say, I'm going to walk. 
I can't deal with this. I can't. Yeah, yeah. And and again, age teaches you this. When yeah. when we're young, we're we're afraid to do that. We're afraid to stick our uh, heads up above the, uh, you know, the prairie dog or the uh, squirrel hole. But at the same point, um, ethics are how people follow us. If we have a strong moral compass, we're, we don't look outside of ourselves for our confidence. It's here. And that's the type of people uh, that other people are looking for right now. Well, if you look at what our conversation was earlier about protecting the dignity of the team, sometimes those are ethical considerations where the executive, either from my own executive or my client's executive, <clears throat> unfairly target my team in such a way that I have to stand up and protect them at all against all odds. So that may be an ethical decision, but more importantly, my team sees that. And I think that enhances their loyalty to me as a project manager, but also to the cause that we're moving forward with. Because every project really is a cause. You're not doing projects just for the sake of keeping people employed. You're doing projects to better mankind in some way whether it's company profits or so the social fabric or something, these projects help. And so, so it is that folks will follow those people who have their best, um, their best thoughts in mind, their best ideas in mind, and, and, and just to be able to protect them from that, from that perspective. Very good. So I do have a final question here. Um, let's have a tools discussion here. Uh, as a project manager, there are certain tools we have that allow us to balance these needs and these constraints that we have. Um, a couple of them that I thought about were the team charter, and you mentioned that earlier, and one you didn't mention earlier called work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what other two or do you want to comment on those first well I, I i'll comment on the first one i think because from a team charter perspective and how it is that we get set off in the right foot to work i i distinctly remember on several of my projects um getting to that point in the project where we had little victories not the full i mean at the end of the project was a huge victory right but we had little victories and so all along we would celebrate those victories, mm -hmm. whether that was getting together in, in my Hawaii project on the beach with all of our families to play volleyball and to swim and to do those sorts of things just to get away from the project. Maybe we'd leave early on a Friday afternoon to do that. So those sorts of tools to keep people um, engaged, I think are very important. Um, I had one situation I'll tell you very quickly where a mother, uh, a mother had been a stay-at-home mom for several years, wanted to get back into the workforce and came to my project. And she didn't want, she didn't want any pressure. She didn't want to do a whole lot of uh, things that would keep her from having to be able to answer her child's needs or, or whatever when they were in daycare. So we, um, she agreed to be our admin. Well, I'm looking and this person was brilliant. And so we had um, a, a set of um, in the old days, we used to have to code tables. We had these tables and we showed her how to do this repetitive process of coding. So that freed up my developers to do some other more complex work while this person, while she's answering phones and doing our timesheets and that sort of thing, coded tables. If you want to see someone whose dignity hit the ceiling and kept going, this woman felt so valuable because she delivered her tables. And when they we were in system test and then acceptance test, she was there looking over our shoulders to see how her tables were. <laughs> so again, that's one of the tools is to give people challenges and have them work towards those challenges in such a way that they increase their worth, increase their self-worth and their feelings of belonging with the team. So training is not just a need to have, it's a critical function in engagement itself. Sure. Wow, what a statement. What are your thoughts? What you were going to talk about, I know you were going to talk about work-life balance. I just oh, yeah. know it. <laughs> First of all, um, let's, let's talk about Maslow. 
and I'll make this short. We, we, we mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs all the time. And it states that we have various levels of needs that need to be fulfilled. And one of the crises we saw with everybody losing their jobs over the last 18 months um, was the fact that all, a lot of Maslow's needs were wrapped up in, in being fulfilled by a job. And if we were to do that in our personal lives, and then we had something that actually hit us, um, that took that one thing away, it would be like having one pylon that you built your house on, and you hit that pylon and it goes. But if we were able to look at life itself as fulfilling needs instead of just the work, and if we could actually create a sense of it's okay to actually find recognition and find rewards and find your social group outside of work, it, it'll make you more resilient. And that's the type of people I really love to work with because number one, they're more resilient when work takes a dive. And number two, they're more interesting. <laughs> they, they have so many other facets to themselves. And that brings different ideas and different perceptions and different contexts, which means more innovation. Yeah. And I, and I think part of the reason that work-life balance gets a black eye often is because people think, well, why am I still doing 80-hour work weeks? Well, no, you're not. You've done a single 80-hour work week because you had to get something done, but then the next week you're back doing something. Maybe take a day off next week. So there's a way to balance things without saying, I have to do exactly eight hours a day. I have to do exactly five days a week. I have to do... So part of that whole misnomer about work-life balance is always is, is also that it that it's a perfect world of, of so so what is recommended is that we say this is my participation in the work and this is how i'm going to measure it as measured by and we need to do this personally and we need to teach everybody else as measured by it's not measured by how many hours i sit in a chair or stare at a computer, or type pages, or words, or finish these, these tasks, but the influence I have on the work. And we need to actually be much more articulate on the impact we have. And, and Merv, if we do this, then nobody's going to be able to argue with us. I put 70 hours over here, so I'm going to put 30 hours over here because your influence is what's being paid for. It's not these mundane tasks that people can track in an Excel spreadsheet. And that's perfect. I remember, oh, I remember this. When um, I had a high producer, and you know what happens to high producers? <laughs> they often get more work, right? Because exactly. someone else. Imagine this project manager going to my high producer and says, you have done such great work this last month. I don't want to see you here till next Monday. And have the rest <laughs> of the team wondering, where did Joe go? How come he gets three days off? Because well, he did that three days work plus the five days last week. <laughs> And I was measuring results, not hours behind the desk. And so there's always that part of it as well. Yep. I, you know, this has been a fun discussion. Again, you and I have so many fun discussions, Tim. And I think in the last couple of minutes here that we have, is there any kind of parting comments that you want to give our, our listeners? Um, no, I think we have wrapped it up. I think this plane has landed quite well. I was going to say the same thing, but I was giving you the opportunity. So, so yeah. uh, there, there are some things that we can follow up with. Oh, definitely. Um, oh. Training, I think we need to spend time on and team building as well. And there's other leadership areas and other humanistic areas that I'd like to explore. And I think we'll yeah. leave them as a surprise for, uh, for our listeners. Well, and, and you brought up one other one, it was culture. I, I, we may have talked a little bit about culture in a previous podcast, but maybe, maybe we should um, give one entire session just on culture and developing it and dealing with it. 
whether it's a ethnic culture on the project or just the way the culture on the project is um, evolves as well. So I think that'd be a fun topic at some point. Oh yeah. <laughs> where, so where are you in during the week? Um, in I'm over on LinkedIn. Uh, reach out to me. Um, and uh, in the next three or four weeks, I'll be sharing some other, uh, other areas you can find me in and you. Same LinkedIn um, and also on my my website, which um, is going to be probably getting an overhaul here shortly, but um, there's still a lot of valuable information at peoplefirstprojectmanagement.com. So oh, that would be visit, fun. Yeah, so come visit Tim and Merv and uh, certainly be back here next week, one o'clock mountain time, and we'll talk to you about another interesting project management topic. Thanks again, everyone, and thank you, Merv, for the opportunity. Until next time, Tim, thank you.